everybody. Welcome to uh, the Gatekeeper session. We're delighted to have um, a fantastic panel of guests here, all of whom have been a really interesting part of every aspect of the business you can think of, television, feature films, development, production. They've been on both sides of the desks, and they're all responsible for some fascinating and original programming. So they've also kindly all brought put with them um, clips uh, to give you a better idea of the kind of programming they do and they're interested in. And we'll start at the end with John Marinas. Um, he's the CEO of Entertainment One, and um, he's going to share with us some of their current production. It's a 30 or 40 minute clip, so <laughs> enjoy. Here you go. What is your business in Sweden? Ah, uh, you can just put down love. <laughs> I just put down unemployed. At Entertainment One Television, there's a new attitude. Thank you! We bring you more. I have seen things that you cannot imagine. Oi! More high quality entertainment. Yeah. It's our turn. This journey always sides with the women. Starting with more from high profile partners. I'm gonna build a computer that nobody else has the balls to build. They have spies everywhere. Fight for what you believe in. People are the best defense against walkers. There's a range war coming. In your railroad, it's about to drive right through it. I need more than talent. I need stars. We are in the middle of the Yukon. We run out of money we are dead. Don't kill him, Mike. It's funny how your mind jumps right to kill him. <laughs> More renewals. It's days like today that just make me realize how much my job means to me. The troubles are still here. How much more can people take? What is happening to you right now is called the first change. That's my life from now on. I'm talking to spirits, ghosts, whatever you are. I am not losing another unpredictable. Is there a target on my back or not? More genres. More like best friends and mother and daughter. Oh, boots, oh, boots. Sorry. We were playing with the dog. What are you afraid of? Snakes and spiders. You're gonna let me drive this? Yeah. And with more on the horizon, the future is more exciting than ever. You gotta let go of that Africa fan. This your home now. Okay. He's all you got. You don't want a thing about him. Let me buy you a drink. Right now it's noon time. Well, it's night time in Sweden. <laughs> With over 2,800 hours of compelling content and 500 broadcast partners in more than 150 countries. Entertainment One Television, are you ready for more? It's so exciting times! What an impressive company that is. <laughs> who said that? Did somebody in the who's, audience say that? Who's, who's in charge of that company <laughs> anyway? <laughs> and uh, we're moving. What kind of man you are. Moving right into Steve Foster. <laughs> well, we're back on you. Well, show them how it feels to lose what they love. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 
encore Steve. presentation. Tell us. Was <laughs> Tell us it was an encore presentation. <laughs> Time is the most important thing in the world to me. You are not a clone. I am a clone! <laughs> Do not remove those underwear! What underwear? I think we all just got to participate in some of the greatest television of all time, and it's a great time to be working in the medium, and um, we're fortunate to have with us such a great panel of people. Uh, I'll just start again because the clips were continuous there. So John Marinas at the end is the CEO of Entertainment One, and you saw the incredible array of programming that they're putting out, and next to him is Steve Foster, he's the Director of Development for HBO Films, and again, there's just so much going on there that's really exciting. And beside him, we have Nicole Clements from FX Networks, and she is the senior VP and head of series development for FX. So the first question I'm going to ask you guys, just to kind of get to know you a little bit, is um, how did you get started in television or film and television since you both went in? What was your first job, John? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm so old, I don't remember my first job anymore. <laughs> um, well, my first job in the business was actually um, uh, as a student, just trying to put shows together. Right. I didn't, I didn't know any better. So. And what were you studying? I was studying law. There you go. Yeah. Look very, what very happened. <laughs> what happened to me? I, you know, my parents said that. Um, no, I think I always wanted to uh, be in an industry that you know had um, a means of expressing yeah. um, itself to a large community. So I was always interested in music and film mm -hmm. and television. So. I think law was sort of a little bit of a detour. And I'll, I'll share me. with you all that John is a major Scrabble aficionado, so he's a man who loves words, and I think that's... Uh, I will challenge anyone here. <laughs> um, but, you know, that really, my, I, I really got into business with Alliance. Yes. Um, that was my first job as a lawyer in 1991, when the company was probably about 40 employees. Great. And Steve, what about you? What brought you to this business? What was your first job? Uh, well, I was an actor. I'm actually a recovering actor. <laughs> I'm in the 12-step program, so we can all relax, which is nice. Are you uh, but that's actually no, I'm not. I'm not kidding. That's what I, that's what I did. I, you know, I was uh, I was acting, but I 
I soon realized that uh, actually my passion was really sort of you know behind the camera, uh, you know, just sort of writing and producing and that sort of thing. And right. so I, I went to USC and sort of dove in head first. And um, you know, I uh, actually my first job technically on the other side of the of the camera, as it were, was as a reader. So I was a story analyst, uh, sort of supporting my writing habit. And uh, one of the places I was reading was Scott Free. Right. Uh, and uh, I segued uh, from that into a development job there. So, nice segue. Yeah. <laughs> I was very fortunate. So. Yeah. And Nicole, what about you? Well, my, uh, my first, first job was as a PA. Mm -hmm. And then my, my first, first job becoming an executive was, I, I mean, I, w I was telling these guys I, I wanted to be in television from an early yes. stage. A lot of people think I made a big transition from film to TV, but I had actually started in TV, so I really feel like I came home. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'd seen 30-something and just was obsessed with that and wanted to do that and didn't know how that happened because I had no connection to the business. Or, right. And so I came down to LA and I started um, working in development at a company called Adelson Baumgarten. And mm -hmm. then my first job job was from assistant at Spelling Television to executive mm -hmm. there. Right. And, uh, and then from there, a couple of things. Yeah. And then a connection to one of John's colleagues who pulled me into agenting against my will. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it I think what's out. fascinating is that all of these guys have worked in so many different aspects of the business on both sides of the desk. and. They're now um, obviously in a position where <clears throat> they're evaluating material as it comes in. It can come in as a pitch. It can come in as a spec script. Um, it can come in through relationships. They're all really important ways to get things started. But you know, the pitch is what, what we'll start with. And um, there's many ways to do it and many ways to receive them. Um, what is it that you like to see or hear, John, in terms of a, a pitch? What's going to get your attention? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, they don't let me go into many pitch meetings anymore, so it's probably a good thing. Um, so uh, for me, I still um, I'm get really excited uh, yes. when they do let me into a pitch, um, as opposed to these guys who are probably getting pitches all the time. Yes. Um, but for me, it's just a, a connection. You know, the, big, the, um, the most interesting pitches are the ones where um, you feel like you're just sitting and someone's telling you a story. Um, uh, and they're really prepared. Mm -hmm. you, if someone is so prepared that you're not feeling like you're hearing a pitch, but you're just someone is telling you a great story. And so some of the best projects that we've certainly done over the years have been very personal mm -hmm. stories. Um, writers or creators or producers come in with something that just is so visceral and connects with them, and because it connects with them, it connects with you. And now at I mean, E1, there's so many doors for people to come through. I mean, you're in Los Angeles, you're in Toronto, and you're suddenly and spectacularly in Vancouver. Um, so how is the, what's the best way for people to, to come to you? Um, it really depends on the project. I mean, you know, we've got a great development team in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And so I think for, for projects that uh, writers or producers uh, or anyone who's got an idea thinks that it makes sense for Canada, they're going to talk to our team in Toronto on the scripted side. Mm -hmm. um, if there's something you know that may be more on the non-scripted side, or something that um, you know where someone has a relationship with one of our companies, Alpha Perny or mm -hmm. Force for here in Vancouver, really should it should be an access point that is uh, where there's some level of connection. I right. mean, you know, if if it's a great project that makes sense in Canada, but the person has to be in LA, they should still go through LA. So really, I think the starting point is, who do you know? Yep. Um, and if you don't know anyone, who do you know that knows someone? Yeah. Uh, and use that as sort of an entry point. It's, it's take the path of least resistance to get in the door. And mm -hmm. then you know, let, let us decide that once we hear the pitch, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense for the UK market. So let's try to figure out a strategy to get in mm -hmm. to the UK. And we have production companies uh, that we have deals with in the UK that we, you know, we're constantly sort of working right. with. So we try to connect the dots. Um, no matter where, no matter what door it comes into. Yeah, so there's a lot of doors at E1 that can go through. Uh, but for films at HBO, there's only one door, and it's Steve. So we're going from a wide gate to a narrower gate that's very specific. Well, it's not just me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have a lot of great colleagues as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I work in the films uh, department at HBO, mm -hmm. so we do the two-hour movies, the self-contained movies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I mean, for me, you know, uh, you know, our mandate obviously is very specific. You know, if, you, if you're familiar with our, our programming, we do a lot of you know sort of nonfiction, you know, uh, you know, real person or event that sort mm -hmm. of thing. 
Inspired um, by true it, stories. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, we don't tend to, to fictionalize a true story, you know, because we really want to make sure to tell the, you know, the actual story as, as close as we can. I mean, certainly not in a, you know, in a, in a, we're not making docudramas, if you understand what mm -hmm. I mean, but, um, but you know, we do, uh, we do, you know, vet our, our material very, very closely. Um, but in terms of, you know, a pitch, I mean, uh, you know, I would echo what you're saying, and that is that, you know, I, you know, I, want, uh, I want to connect with the emotion of the story. Mm -hmm. I want to connect with the characters. You know, I want to connect with their story and, you know, what is the, what is the takeaway of, of the story? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, a good pitch, you have to be very well prepared, but so prepared that it feels conversational. Yes. That it feels like, like you were saying, you know, you're just you're just telling a story. You don't want yeah. somebody talking at you. Exactly. You want somebody talking to That's you. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, you know, we also look for, you know, authenticity mm -hmm. uh, in the storytelling, you know, and in, in the, you know, the characters, um, you know, a unique angle. You know, we, we do tend to do a lot of you mm -hmm. know, so called biopics, that sort of thing. But, you know, we're always looking for that that angle, you know, that 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 angle in that, you know, it's almost like you think you know the story, yes, but you don't know the story. So. And with that kind of specificity, you know, how much time do you spend taking pitches? Like, what of your, you know, of your day, of your week? How much of it is about receiving material? You know, I mean, it depends. I mean, you know, certainly we're always, you know, actively looking for for good material. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that comes in the door, you know, through pitches or or you know scripts or you know or or books, you know, what yes. have you. Uh, you know, there are very, you know, I think there are a lot of ways to find great material. Very excited about Olive Kitteridge. Oh, Spectacular yes. <laughs> novel. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, those are, uh, those are my colleagues in miniseries, yes. and they do a great job, and, and I think you'll be very pleased with, uh, with the results. Great. And Nicole, what about you? You've also got a staff that's you know. it, we're pretty small, actually. Yeah. It's, it's my team, is myself and, and my vice president Kate Lambert and my director mm -hmm. Kevin Wandell, and it's we cover all you know, really uh, original programming scripted is FXX and FX right now. Mm -hmm. We'll eventually go to FXM, but <clears throat> we cover all those networks, drama and comedy. So it's pretty, it's pretty small. So um, I would echo originality, authenticity. Um, I would add to that that. Look, from the, it, the worst thing is if somebody comes in with pages and puts them in front of their face and reads <laughs> off a document. Because the first thing we're doing is looking at pages like this and yes. thinking, oh my God. How long is this going to take? Hours. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, that's just the, on, the, on the technical side. And there's so many different ways to pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say there's, uh, there's an art to it. We, I, wouldn't expect so, I wouldn't expect a formula in the way that you know, our shows are on the cable side ultimately 91 hour movies. They're, they're character journeys. So yeah. first and foremost, we're looking for um, a fantastic character. Um, <clears throat> and something that, again, it's, it's surprising. There's like a very strong point of view. If you look at our shows, mm. they're all very auteur driven. You know what a Kurt Sutter show is. You know what a Ryan Murphy show is. So when we're trying to find that, that next show, it doesn't have to be from somebody that is already a name. But it's in, in then that person that you believe could have that point of view that is going to be so singular, because if you if you think about it, you know our our shows are essentially somewhat familiar genres that have been somehow subverted Skewed. that become the yeah. Trojan horse that carries in the character and the thing that it's about. So it's it's you know I'm looking for I'm looking for characters that are driving plot through that character journey as opposed to characters that are reacting to plot, which is a lot of what you'll see on a network show. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you could take a show like 24, which is a fantastic show, and Jack Bauer is a really dark and complicated character, and you could think like, okay, you push the violence, push the sex, and that could be on, on cable. But the truth is Jack Bauer is reacting to plot in every scenario, as mm -hmm. opposed to Vic Mackey or Jax Teller, who are on that character journey and everything that happens is through that lens for Jax Teller of going from being a boy to a king in that Hamlet motif that underlies a motorcycle club. Right. Well, the kind of talent that you guys are all working with doesn't always mean they're the best people to present their material. So, you know, <laughs> the, sometimes That's the true. pitch isn't reflective of the, the, the outcome. It's true. So, you know, is there a situation with any of you where, you know, you were completely surprised by how well it turned out or how badly it turned out, having had a pitch that, you know, sort of set you up in one direction or another? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, you know, it's, 
of course, it, it's just a pitch. So yeah. there's so many other elements that go that go into it. Um, yeah. You know, I th I, we've had experiences. Sometimes I think you try to overachieve um, and package too much. Yeah. I mean, th we're living in a world now where packaging has become so important. Um, we were talking about it earlier about, especially with Nicole, you know, be, being into TV when it wasn't cool. Now it's cool. It's almost <laughs> like, you know, features is sort of it has, the independent feature world's morphed into the to the TV world we that we have now. And it's the really exciting. Come with it's it. it's yeah. you know the level of talent that is uh, is attracted to the storytelling that, that can occur in, in television is quite exciting. And I think as a result, you're seeing as least we're seeing as an independent studio and the studios are doing and a lot of other producers you're spending way more um, on scripts. Now, we're, we're funding scripts before we even go in and pitch. We're packaging right. and putting all the pieces together before we go, not all the time, mm -hmm. but when there's something that just seems right. And, and, uh, and there's risk and reward to that because mm -hmm. I think you can go down a path and then realize, wow, that was really not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, t the adage of TV is, you know, it's not about stars, you, TV creates stars, but in this day and age, I just find more and more everyone we're talking all the networks they want that marquee name. It's such a noisy place that everyone wants something to help the market promote to pull, pull in. It's so funny because audience. I would prefer to have the writer. Mm -hmm. Ag agreed. You know what I mean? Just yeah. the just so that we can grow it in our own model, as opposed to and it's it's hard. I, I, my agent brain understands this direct to series model of the full package because you're mm -hmm. going. You know, you're going for the, for the brass ring. The difficulty is you've got all these buyers with different points of view about what they're looking for. So you, it's, a, it's a smaller bullseye to hit. If you hit it, it's fantastic. It's threading a needle. Exactly, right? it's yeah. threading a needle. Whereas in the pitch, there's a lot of projecting that goes onto a pitch in answer to your question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I find mm -hmm. I, I would always be looking for the, oh, this could be amazing, and you're sort of ignoring, you know, if you mm -hmm. end up writing the pitch in the room for them or filling it in, it can be dangerous. But, mm -hmm. but there is something great about, you know, being able to take it from the ground up and find find that that right because it's, it's a very organic process yeah. and, even as, right. and as a series as we know even when you're shooting the show it's organic and totally. even as you know you go from one episode to the yeah. next the pilot script to the pilot to the series yeah. it's three different yeah so variations. so the one thing I do know is it changes dramatically yes sometimes better <laughs> sometimes worse but it but it does have it you does ever been change. completely surprised though in a pitch like say there's no relationship it's just coming out of left field and suddenly you're going hey what's going on here. You mean in terms in of a, in a in project a, coming in and you're, you're you're not expecting anything? Oh, I, I I would say you're the worst was that for me. Stephen Falk came in yes. and sat down and he you know a lot of people will talk about a show they'll sort of go macro and go into and then then if it's going well pitch you the actual pilot story. Mm -hmm. He sort of sat down and did talk about why what he wanted to do in general right. in terms of sort of looking at Mad About You as the as a as a structure for a comedy but right. taking it with a narcissist and a liar. <laughs> and then he basically just pitched the pilot. And I went, I don't, I just sort of went in and I just saw the whole show and I was like, yes, do that. Yeah. Right? And then he turned in that script, which also never happens. You know, you just yes. get, you get the script that matches the pitch. The one that but you saw. But it was so yeah. in his head and he is so Jimmy yeah. in that show. He is writing his character. And a few months later we were making it. I mean, that was... That was it's fast. Foil, it was foiled me. It was one of my one of the first things out the door, and then you're thinking like, why isn't it all going like this? This is easy. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I would agree. I mean, you know, I think that you know, <coughs> television now has become. I mean, you know, it's a whether you want to call it the golden age of television or the second golden age of television or whatever. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the content that is being created, I think, across the board, is extraordinary. Uh, but the downside of that is that you have to, as you say, really sort of cut through the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I think one of the reasons why you know it's sort of a, a, a race to the top as far as top talent is because you have to sort of be able to market it. You have to be able to sort of say, "Hey, look, we have so and so," mm -hmm. you know, and this is going to be a great event. You know, you know, this is as you, we were talking earlier. You know, the old NBC must see TV. Thursday night. Uh, you know, Thursday night, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, how do you drive, right. you know, viewers to, you know, seeing, you know, the, the series or the movies or, or, or the miniseries, whatever, that you're, that you're presenting. Uh, and so, you know, I think one of the things, unfortunately, is that, you know, when we, when we look at a pitch or we evaluate any, uh, any sort of material that's coming in, you know, we have to look at it with an eye for what sort of event is this going to be? You know, do we see, and also do we see a path to production? 
you know, because we're not going to bring, I mean, and I'm speaking strictly for the films division right now. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not going to, you know, really bring anything in unless we see that there could be a path to pro uh, production eventually. That's not to say that, you know, I mean, it'll eventually get there. Obviously, we all know that things happen, mm -hmm. things fall out, you develop a lot more than what you actually produce, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it has to have that event to it. You know, and, and, you know, how do you define an event these days? You know, I mean, there's one way to define an event, obviously, is through the talent. Uh, you know, another way to define the event is, you know, for us is, you know, the story can be the event, you know, yeah, in the, in so the terms of... you were saying of, that Behind the Candelabra, for example, came in with the talent. It was fully formed. And well, exactly. I mean, you know, that, that had been um, developed at Warner Brothers for several years. Um, yeah. And I, I guess they just sort of threw up their hands and, and didn't really know what to do with it. And... Uh, Jerry Weintraub, who had a relationship, obviously, with HBO, brought it to us with a great script by Richard Lagravenez. Uh, Steven Soderbergh was attached to direct. It had Michael and Matt. And, you know, we were sort of like, can you start shooting Tuesday, you know? Um, <laughs> the path to production was clear. <laughs> exactly. You know, how do you say no to that? But on the flip side, what's interesting about that mm -hmm. is if someone had approached us, let's say, yeah. and said hey, you know what, would you guys be interested in doing a Liberace biopic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so true. Probably not. Not to say that Liberace wasn't a fabulous performer and, and yeah. you know, and, and, and bigger than life and that sort of thing. But, you know, again, what is that event? Yeah. Right. You know. that's, the, that's the struggle. I mean, one of the reasons I left film was I was really tired of calling clients and saying, hey, they're remaking Mr. Ed. You know, oh, I just made the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles deal. It felt like every, it was so bifurcated, and it was all mm. brand and right. no artistry. And then the independent films were just, impo I mean, just so, here we are at a film festival. Yeah. I'm sure every single director could tell you the pathway to production was not easy. Yeah. And um, I see, you know, the need, because there are so many scripted dramas, and you, to cut through, and in a world where there's no real live same-day watching anymore. Yeah. So to be able to be in the, you know, to either get the live same day breast ring or to be in the top five on your DVR list. The binge viewing. You have to have, you know, you have to have an event. And it's sort of like, I'm, mm -hmm. I personally am like, really don't want TV to go to the remaking titles and this, mm -hmm. you know, the Fruit Loops, you know, kind of uh, yeah. series or whatever. But it's, it's, it's so many different ways. Like, the strain was Guillermo del Toro, yeah. his books, right? And then we were able to put Corey Stoll into it. Mm -hmm. But that's an event behind the concept and the name and the people involved. And then Tyrant was the title. There's an, really an actor that is of name recognizability, but it was the title and that sort of the world that nobody had seen yet on television. Right. So there are different ways to go, but it's it's harder and harder to, to figure that out because it's not... Good. You can't, it's not good enough to be good. Mm -hmm. You have to break through. Right. Yeah, it really is. I mean, f from the supplier side, from the studio side, you know, we have, we have so much development with so many, mostly cable networks, because right. again, we just, it, to, uh, to your point, you know, uh, we find that cable tends to develop to produce yes. and broadcast never tends to develop to develop. <laughs> and we just want to have more shots. But, you know, by the time you get to the stage where a network is considering that pilot script, it's been written, you know, maybe packaged in something, maybe not, you know, th the rigor that goes in the development process now is quite exciting. I mean, it's always been that way, but now I think the bar is even higher. Um, mm -hmm. and, and never been more challenging because, because there's so much original mm -hmm. development, it's hard to find writers. Well, they're not working. Yes. I mean, they're not, they're not out there creating original material. They either have their own show or they're yeah, on a right. show. It's impossible yeah. to staff a show. It's so funny. We were just talking about the writer strike where it seemed like I'm married to, it was like no one's ever working again. Right, exactly. To, we can't staff our shows because <laughs> right. there's no, yeah. you know, there's a lot of feature talent coming in and mm -hmm. young writers, a great opportunity for, for mm -hmm. young people. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 really bizarre how it flips so fast. And, you know, and, and speaking to your point, you know, I, you know, and just in looking at you know what the studios were doing ten years ago, fifteen years ago, what they're doing now as far as in the film world, mm -hmm. um, you know, they just don't want to know from drama. You know, they don't they don't care. You know, it's I mean, they'll do their few prestige pictures every year just to sort of be sort of in the Oscar race and and that sort of thing. But you know, unless your name is you know, Clooney or Eastwood or, you know, these great filmmakers, no, no question. Yeah. Um, you're just not getting a chance, especially with the material that, that we tend to do. So in that respect, it's, it's a blessing for us because there's a lot of, of great material out there that needs to find a home. Yeah. But, you know, in speaking of, you know, the event 
you know, because we are a, a in effect, we are gearing towards one showing. Right. You know, uh, it's not like a series where certainly the premiere is very important, but you do have the opportunity to build uh, an audience over time, or or to build you know a buzz, or or to really mm -hmm. have the series take on a life of its own. You know, we're really working towards that that premiere, that night that it premieres. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think the pressure on us is, a, is a, even a little higher but you're not to make it that space, event. So how, so. You're not so much focused on ratings as much as subscriptions, so how much pressure is on you for that premiere well, as you know, I mean, to, I, for the reviews or for... Well, I think, I think you know, certainly just, uh, you know, the, the buzz factor. The buzz factor. You know, the, the, yeah, not the, the reviews, the, the word of mouth. The word of mouth, you know, yeah. just sort of the conversation that creates. You know, we, you, know, we, you know, we like to, you know, create a conversation on the things that we do okay. because, we, you know, we want it to obviously, you know, be part of the zeitgeist and, and really get people talking about it. Right. You know, mm -hmm. Game Changer was a, was a perfect example of that. Uh, too Big to Fail, mm -hmm. um, certainly Candelabra was one where, you know, it, it was just really buzzy and it, and it got, got people talking yeah. and, you know, that sort of thing. So, but like I said, it's, you know, so we're, we're driving towards that, you know, mm -hmm. that one night. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, we're not necessarily as, you know, as ratings driven. Obviously, we want people to see our movies and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But, um, you know, it's a, bigger, it's a bigger component, but, you know, it's, that's certainly, you know, very important. And your movies have a long life. I mean, your movies play and play. And, I mean, I know I've seen several of them several times. <laughs> well, I mean, no question. And, you know, we're obviously very fortunate because, you know, we can certainly yeah. replay them on our... On so for the, the, the talent that doesn't have... Uh, it isn't looking for a home because it's not already a name. Um, how important are spec scripts? Spec, well, spec scripts are a, a big part of um, uh, what can become our development. Um, there are a lot coming in. I think a lot of people, um, especially the newer, well, e either tried and true television people who've worked in network who want to reinvent themselves. Right. A lot of times, I mean, I'm speaking from my agent brain yeah. again, would, their agents would recommend that they write the spec. Basically, they've mm -hmm. been through the system and the network system and beleaguered with notes and the process and worn down and all the corners, mm -hmm. you know, rounded on their work that they want to let loose and write the thing that you know, nobody thinks that they can write and nobody's going to restrain them and no one's going to give them notes. Let them out of the box. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times that, that can become material that comes in the door that's really exciting to us. Um, and then a lot of times it's a feature writer who's never done television who might mm -hmm. not have a whole lot of track record and wants to, you know, that, it's a great way because we're, you know, we're all hungry to find, mm -hmm. you, it, it's great. It's on the page or it's not on the page. Right. And do they all I mean? come through the door with an agent or just some of them just come in cold? No, we can't accept unsolicited material. So okay. it's all yeah, coming the in the door way. through an agent okay. or, or a producer who we do a lot of business with or a manager. Um, so there's still a relationship at play. Oh, yeah, there's right. absolutely a relationship. If we open the floodgates, for, yeah, it'd yeah. yeah. be scary. Part of the gatekeeping process. Exactly, but <laughs> the thing is, is that, look, and as an agent, that was the big question I would always get in, in these kind of forums is how do I submit material? But And I think mm -hmm. John sort of touched on it earlier, but... Mm -hmm. Find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. I guarantee you're six degrees of separation away from somebody who's an assistant, a cousin to an assistant <laughs> on someone's desk. Right. And cream rises. And so if you can get your script read by everybody, mm -hmm. it'll get to the people that it needs to get to. Don't do the unsolicited submission. It's a waste of... It is. It's not a waste of paper anymore because it's email. But right. it's not. Mm -hmm. It's going to just get bounced back. And, and it, it's much better to have your material you know, read and find those... Yeah. Those but, I, you know, I also think, you know, it, something exciting that's going on is sort of what I call the democratization of, of the industry in many ways. And that is that, you know, <clears throat> you know several years ago, in order to do a, a short film or, or something of that nature, I mean, you had to have twenty to three thousand dollars and you had to have, you know, a whole group of people to, you know, to mount this production. And, and there really w wasn't a lot of distribution channels to really sort of for people mm -hmm. to see your work. I and mean, maybe you went to film school or mm -hmm. something like that. You know, the agents would come for the first looks and, and that sort of thing. But nowadays, I mean, you know, for very little money, you, you can get a D5 camera and you can, you know, put something on the Internet and, yeah. you know, and really showcase your work in a, in a variety of different ways. And that may be mm -hmm. another way to sort of get attention. Um, I will say that, you know, I tell this to, you know, all, you know, um, sort of new filmmakers and that sort of thing, and that is that, for me, the script is the king. Um, you know, it's very, it's great, you know, if you want to be a director, certainly, you know, mm -hmm. it's important to, you know, get that work out there, but, you know, really, it's that script that that's, it's that piece of material, it's that, it's that business uh, that you can transact. Uh, so even if you're doing a short film, you're putting it on YouTube or whatever, 
you really should have a, a couple of really great scripts to follow up and you know once <coughs> once you do finally get that yeah. meeting. I, I, you know, I agree. I just want to uh, in the idea of of uh, the democratization of our, our of our business is really quite exciting because you can yeah. um, you can uh, create short form content and it mm -hmm. can live mm -hmm. online. And we're, I mean, we're certainly you know, um, going throughout sort of, you know, various online platforms, YouTube channels, you know, multi-channel networks, and we're looking for, you know, exciting talent. And we're, you know, now doing deals with YouTube stars, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a whole new world of, of exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the gatekeeper actually is, to a certain extent, is going away a little bit, which is kind of exciting. So we won't have this panel last uh, next year because yeah, yeah, there will be no gatekeepers. Yeah. <coughs> well, you know, actually, you know, interesting you bring that up because you know Variety, I think, had a, an article a, a few weeks ago about, and it really surprised me, but not really, uh, <laughs> about how it, among teenagers, YouTube stars mm -hmm. were more popular oh, yeah. than yes, established yeah. movie stars. That, yeah. that right. they that they had greater name recognition, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a it's a brave new world. And there's now it YouTube really agents. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's another yeah. new industry coming yeah. at us. Yeah. Listen, you can't <coughs> you can't ignore it, mm -hmm. and you know some of them don't have a lot of talent that translates into linear television, yeah. but some of them do. And you know, especially in the comedy space, I find yeah. Yeah. Co comedy because it does lend itself to short form. Yeah. <coughs> There's a wealth of talent yeah. mm -hmm. uh, online doing short form content, and it's just fun to kind of you know. Yeah. Find I've, yeah. I've I've auctioned all of the cat videos I can find, <laughs> um, so pretty well cornered that market. Say, but there must be like a million it's of a them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it is exciting, and but it, but at the same time, I agree. If you're a writer, um, you yeah. and you're not you're not proven, you, you have a script. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, or and can or. Yeah. Or there's so many contests. Demonstrate. There's the you got to demonstrate. Contest, yeah. There's, the, yeah. there's so many ways to, to, to break through. And, and really, I mean, it's mm -hmm. if, it, if you have a phenomenal script and you just get it read, it will, it will make its way. It'll, it'll bubble to the it'll, top. It'll, it'll find yeah, its way up. Yeah. yeah, and I think yeah. that's one of the most interesting shifts, as John says, like next year, there won't be a gatekeeper panel. It's You're out there looking for talent. It is a competitive environment, mm -hmm. and it is hard to find yeah. uh, people who are free and clear completely and you can get them to you know come in and actually start work right away on the timeline that you need them it's also exciting because of just you know the the scarcity of, of uh, writing talent and you know just generally creative talent because the volume of, of original production is so big especially in the US now mm -hmm. it is there's an opportunity on a global basis for um, you know for writers and producers to break into the US because I'm, you know, I'm assuming that's you know part of the theme of this panel because we're all mm -hmm. talking you know really focusing on US buyers and US pitches but the truth is you know I'm assuming there are a lot of Canadians in this audience um, <laughs> hi um, but the truth is there's never been a better time yeah. for non -Amer non Americans to break into the US market because of the scarcity uh, of, of talent because there's so much volume, whatever, there's 50 or 60 networks commissioning original programming. So, you know, I know that we're, we're, we're looking in the networks we're working with, we're, we're, we're scanning a, a global marketplace, oh, yeah. not yeah. just an American market. Mm -hmm. yep. It's always been that way, but it's never been more mm -hmm. pronounced, and um, I've never seen more openness to networks. I think Sherry really. Elwood just sold Oh, the yeah, exactly. Thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, way I know to go. I know yeah, it's great. Just, so I think there's a huge opportunity yeah. to look at the U.S. market from Canada and say, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's demand. The demand is really significant. I mean, my, the, the small little example, but I always, I always uh, talk about it because I just think it's so interesting is we sold this little quirky comedy, Welcome to Sweden, which we showed up. Yeah. I'm, I'm really making a lot is of sound you? here. Yeah. yeah, I was like, "Is that me?" Is it, it, it could be my chest hair. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, you know, we sh we shot it. We, sh we shoot it. Yeah. We're, we're, we've got a second season order. But yeah. we, we shoot it in Stockholm. Um, it was commissioned by a, a Swedish broadcaster, yeah. and they're the they're the main broadcaster, they're putting up most of the money. Uh, part of the show is shot in the Swedish language. It's a you know, Amy Poehler is executive producing, but the mm -hmm. truth is, it stars an unknown uh, guy named Greg Poehler, happens to be her brother. Um, <laughs> And it's on NBC. And it's and, you subtitled. Know, it's yeah. partly subtitled. I know it's fantastic. I know. I don't think that would have happened <laughs> mm -hmm. a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. 
The globalization is really interesting. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. a show like Tyrant would I mean, it wouldn't even have been contemplated five years ago, I don't think. I don't think people would have thought people were ready. Or just, or even the comedians is a Swedish format, the format business, yeah. which has been going on for a while, but that's a huge, huge um, source of, of well, material yeah. for us. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, the global market, I mean, it's expanding exponentially. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, as we said, great material is great material. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and we work, with, we work with a lot of, you know, English writers, Canadian writers, writers from New Zealand, I mean, I, yes. everywhere, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. uh, it's really all about the material. And, yeah, you know, and that's where the connect. doors are wide open. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I find um, more with U.S. writers, they're, they they look for material like they're waiting for someone to bring them an idea, um, and I find the Brits are a little different. They're more they have more ideas um, uh, mm -hmm. from a writing point of view, and not that American writers don't have great ideas, but I think they're 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 seasoned now to sort of uh, uh, sort of you know um, we have do a lot of general meetings, and it's all a lot of it is about writers going what do you got, mm -hmm. you know what you know or, or they hear about a mm -hmm. format that we. That we acquired, and they want they want it, they want in. So I think you know if you can source as a producer underlying material, mm -hmm. any kind of intellectual property formats for sure, feature film, you know mm -hmm. even obscure, yeah. you know independent mm -hmm. features, uh, but that have something really interesting to say, uh, mm -hmm. that could that that will get um, people excited. For sure. And how often do you find yourselves putting talent and material together? Does that happen very often, or is the talent coming in with the material they want to do? Let's say you found a book. And there's a writer out there you want to work with, and you, you know. Um, we, you know, it's funny. We have, we have, a, we don't have that many writing assignments. We will occasionally mm -hmm. have a book, or we'll have. We have a project that um, that Q-Tip and um, um, Appy and Way brought in, mm -hmm. and we have been looking for a writer for that. And we had a life rights situation come in through mm. Legendary and Lorenzo de Bonaventura and we're looking for a writer. But that, I would say, is literally probably, a, a, you know, at the most a tenth of our development. For us, we're looking for, it's so it's so important that it, it is sort of that story that that writer is dying to tell, yeah. that only they can tell, mm -hmm. that it's, it, you, it's hard sometimes to match it and put it into, you get a lot of people who are looking for a job, and mm -hmm. that organic chemistry doesn't happen. That creates a fantastic show from that. But right. so it's a harder search, you know. But, so originality um, is is really critical. That's premium. Yeah, that's the premium. For yeah, us. I mean, I think I saw something online that with you saying, you know, that your brand at FX is is basically the aggregate of the, the successful shows you've had. Yeah, it's it's not. Look, if you look at it in a network like ABC, they're sort of you know they'll take us for Grey's Anatomy and put that ABC brand into yes. into their shows or whatever is mm -hmm. working, which isn't, I, I'm, I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. There's just a sort of like, this is what works, let's try and do that over and over again. Yeah. If you, ours is a, it's a curative brand. It's sort of, you look back over and you go, oh, okay, this is... Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Tyrants. Exactly. How did we get here? Exactly, yeah. Archer, Adam Reed. It's, yeah. it's really, the, our brand is a singular point of view. That's yeah. really what it is, and, and it's just ever evolving, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, we're that... You could say anything. I would say we're that intersection of pulp and literature, but there are different balances on right. each side, which creates, you know, its own its own thing. Yeah, it's not that long ago there was boxing on effects. The trajectory's been incredible. Yeah. 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 Now, Steve, is there any discoveries you've made in terms of talent that you're particularly proud of, or ex you know? Well, you know, I mean, I, you, I, well, I mean, I was speaking to the uh, to the. Uh, earlier question yes. and, and that is that um, you know you know do we you know, most of what we do obviously you know comes to us uh, I agree with you I mean it's mm -hmm. really you know it starts with the script it starts with the story it starts with the idea that sort of thing we don't tend to have a lot of open writing assignments either mm -hmm. you know just simply because you know that material sort of you know, comes to us um, and sometimes you know talent is attached sometimes we attach talent it's really sort of a you know a mm -hmm. project by project basis right. um, that we do that for but, and I'm sorry, your, ne your next question was... Okay, so just moving on to sort of the discovery of talent and, you know, finding somebody that hasn't been on anyone else's radar with a spec script or through an introduction or... You know, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there have been, I mean, I, there have been, a, a, sure, there have been a, a couple of people, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, although I don't know, uh, I mean, they were, they were very well established beforehand, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, certainly, you know, we do... 
we work with a lot of established writers, such mm -hmm. as the Richard Lagravenezes of the world. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, there've been, you know, like Peter Gould. You know, he wrote Too Big to Fail, right? Uh, which was really sort of in the early stages of Breaking Bad. You know, mm -hmm. we all know that that he did incredible work on Breaking Bad, and now he's co-creator of Better Call Saul. Yeah. Um, but did a phenomenal job for us on Too Big to Fail. Uh, Deb Kahn is another uh, writer uh, who we've worked with who is just phenomenal. Um, she started on the West Wing, um, right. but um, you know she's gone on and I mean her career is absolutely blowing up and she's doing great things. So, right. what about you, John? Is there anybody that you feel you've kind of spotted early on, or your company spotted early on that has uh, gone on to? Kenny versus Fanny, I think that was yes. About it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think you know we we work with a lot of you know we call young or baby writers, um, but again, it's you know it's usually we're we're marrying them with with someone that's more experienced, so we can help them. But you you provided a lot of sort of first showrunner opportunities, particularly for Canadians. I think with the absolutely yeah. well again, you know it's there's you know uh, unfortunately there's it, it's tough to find you know, a lot of seasoned Canadian showrunners yeah. uh, based in Canada. Yeah. Um, a lot of the good ones end up leaving and, and moving to LA, as, as we know. So, but also, it's also great because it gives an opportunity for younger, less experienced writers to sort of, you know, have a chance. I mean, you know, when I talked to David Shore about his move years ago yeah. uh, from uh, Toronto to Los Angeles, I think he realized he had to move when I think they asked him to showrun Traders after he'd only been working for a few years. And, right. it was like, and, and for him, it was exciting, because, oh, I get to show run a TV series, a yeah. drama series. And then he thought, well, if I'm show running the show, I have no one uh, left to teach me how to show run. Yes. And so he moved. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of what, what would happen sometimes with you know, the Canadian writers. If they, if they want to learn how to be show runners, you've got to actually work with show runners. Yeah, get in the room. So yeah, we try our best to sort of you know, nurture mm -hmm. and grow the talent here and keep keep the talent in And Canada. keep the talent, yeah, yeah at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Nicole? Well, I think It's Always Sunny is a really good example of that, oh. which, I, which predates me, but yeah. it's the perfect example mm -hmm. of really unknowns and also, you know, with a, with a short piece of, of actual shot material right. that, that John Landgraf took a chance on. And mm -hmm. um, I think um, for me, I would say, you know, Chris Gere and Aya Cash, who I think are... The, the, the cast, if you're the worst, is very yes. little known. They're uh, married, are you know, le like we more well known, especially in the comedic and the comedy circle. And then yeah. of course Judy Greer and Nat Faxon and and Brett Gelman and Jenny Slate. So I certainly can't say we discovered them, but I'm. You super gave them a platform. Yeah, and John yeah. Hodgman. I think we're. I think this is. We got them at the perfect storm um, mm -hmm. of of for all of them. I think thing great things are happening. Um, you know. Um, that's on the talent side. On the on the writing side, there are some I, there are some things I'm excited about that are mm -hmm. coming up, bubbling through. That I'm hopeful will yeah. be those people, you know. Um, but uh, it, it's that's the most exciting aspect of the business for me. I yeah. mean, that's you know, what I was just going to say. What gives you the most pleasure in your job? I love that. That yeah. was what I loved about being an agent was mm -hmm. finding somebody and then taking them, to watching that career grow. And so it's it's the same thing now, being able to give somebody that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, and we really, really believe in the showrunner. Joe Weisberg um, had never run a show before, was a novelist, had been in the CIA, and we developed one pilot mm -hmm. script with him that just didn't didn't quite get there. And then the Americans, you know, happened. Yeah. And um, and then we partnered him with Joel Field and um, Phil Fields and uh, Josh Brand as support. But in a very different model than a lot of what happens, I think, in broadcast network, where they're sort of looking for a showrunner to come in and, and mimic it. Yeah. Our our whole philosophy is you can't. We don't want to do the show without the showrunner. You've got to have the DNA of that creator there. So, that's uh, that's a, a you know great example of. So how do they support in that situation? Um, well, they're essential. I mean, now Joe runs the show. Right. His you know in his He's first up and season. Going. Exactly. They're there. Josh is consulting. Joel is with him. But it's Joe's. You know, Joe has has mm -hmm. the has the wheel, but they you know are there as training wheels basically. Right. But it's his show with the idea that it's his voice, his show, and they're just there to to, to support because That's it is great. a whole different skill set. Yeah, running a show is like being a CEO. Mm -hmm. You know, you really right. not everybody has that skill yeah. set. And you, you have, have to be to a manager yeah. and a creative talent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you have to be a, not everybody has 
pitching ability and sales ability. Yeah. It's a great when you do as an agent, we always mm -hmm. would look, you know, it was fabulous talent, but you were also hoping that they could sell themselves because that's so 50% yeah. of the job. Yeah. And also, you know, we ask ourselves, I think John Magrath sat down with Joe for lunch before he picked up the show to really sit across from him and say, like, do I feel like you can become the showrunner? Yeah, is you it know? worth and my time and energy? To yeah, because it's a huge investment. Yeah, at this, and, you know. and also stepping away from his own work in order to give that opportunity. Yeah, and yeah. then he really came through. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very interesting model. What gives you the most pleasure in your job, Steve? Well, working story. I mean, yeah. working with talent and just, you know, working mm -hmm. on story and helping to, you know, create characters and great, you know, emotional journeys. And I mean, that's really, you know, why I got into the business was just, you know, to tell stories. Great. And uh, I love it. Yeah. So. John? Um, for me now, it's just exciting to keep building B1. I, I get a lot of, you know, it's fun to, you know, we're, now that we're in partnership with our two Vancouver-based companies, yeah. um, that's that's fun because it, 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 it turns the company um, into a new and different entity yeah. and creates something bigger and better. And uh, so for me, it's, at this point, it's less, unfortunately, about an individual project, uh, but it's the project I feel that I'm developing is, 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 this, E1. is this E1 company and where and where it's going to go and and again the globalization of our of our um, industry is really exciting to me yeah okay well I think we'll move to the audience now for questions two questions what's the sort of landscape that you see and how can independent producers work with broadcast networks to achieve kind of the best success for digital media um, okay, I'll start. I, first of all, I think, you know, I don't, I don't even know what digital media is anymore because to me it's just content. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, it's me, to me it's more about what's the form of the content. You know, what are we talking about? Are we talking about marketing assets uh, that, that go alongside some, a linear program? Um, or are we talking about the idea of developing content that lives and breathes initially in an online, you know, uh, nonlinear environment? And, um, you know, so for us, you know, investing in secret locations is exciting because, you know, for, for, for us, they're a company that just um, is, you know, has great ideas that is, you know, able to work with broadcasters and take, you know, linear programming and add to it. Uh, but also they create their own content, original content that lives and breathes on its own without even connecting necessarily to it. A singular broadcaster. It could be. It could live online in our own channel. It could live online, you know, in any number of multi-channel, you know, uh, networks or other online platforms. So I think to me, what's exciting about where we're headed is um, it offers more opportunities to develop, uh, incubate mm -hmm. uh, content, and get it out there in some fashion, even if, you know, whether it's a thousand people that end up viewing it or you know, a hundred million people that end up viewing it. Just it, it allows you to find uh, an audience if something that you make um, is something that someone wants to watch. And then there's the viral component as well, like the social media mm -hmm. aspect is becoming so crucial to get the word out about anything that we do. So that's a big part, obviously, of the, of the digital media mm -hmm. landscape is creating those assets that will help spread the word. I think that's absolutely crucial. Again, the noisy market we talked about here today mm -hmm. and how... Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you can be overwhelmed by the content that's available to you uh, from, you know, whether it's the channels um, that, you know, these mm -hmm. folks represent here from Netflix or Amazon and all the multi-channel networks. So to have some kind of social media component to what we're doing is absolutely crucial. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. And, you know, we, we have a, a separate social media department um, that deals with, uh, with all of that, you know, creating those digital assets and really you know, uh, trying to reach out to as many people, you know, through social media as we possibly can with, you know, uh, and not just doing it in the standard way, but, you know, also mm -hmm. creating an event mm -hmm. online as well, right. you mm -hmm. know, to sort of sort of drive, you know, drive eyeballs. Uh, and, you know, it's very exciting, and, and what they're coming up with is, is so creative. And I think it's only going to get, you know, more involved, you know, as it goes along. Yeah. I mean, look, I... I Exactly the same. I mean, I think social social media and that kind of marketing is is ab absolutely essential for our programming. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in terms of again content, we're we're looking online for new content that we're not necessarily incubating. 
mm-hmm. online. Um, I'm not sure if we'll ever do that, maybe, possibly. Um, <clears throat> but I think, um, I mean, for example, um, Married had a sizable jump in awareness because we had a great red band trailer and put, uh, you know, put, did a big push right before the launch of the show and saw the correlation. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's key. I mean, we're looking for people to proselytize our shows, and social mm-hmm. media is absolutely integral right. to right. that. Yeah, so. absolutely. And you're seeing, I mean, um, AMC put Halt and Catch Fire on Tumblr, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, uh, w- before it actually launched. So there's mm-hmm. just, there's an interesting kind of intersection now uh, between marketing, you know, kind of viral campaigns, mm-hmm. original content, linear content, and then how to kind of uh, ensure that you find an audience beyond just your... Yeah, I mean, even Amazon's testing, or yeah. they're sort of, I'm not sure yeah. if they're making their decisions off the voting or not, but it is certainly a great <laughs> yeah. way to get a lot of buzz around <laughs> right. the right. show. Just feeling that you possibly have, right. Exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did you vote? Yeah. Did you vote? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, you want to create, you want to be part of a conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's really what it is. And so Netflix sort of dumping all of the episodes yes. all at once you know, there was a sort of interesting moment where we were like, okay, is that going to yeah. shorten the conversation? Mm-hmm. Do you have a longer conversation when yeah. you're anticipating a series and then, you know, Play it people out. are catching up to it? You know, it's, well, it's I think, it's all I think kind of it also changing. gives, you know, what's interesting to me about it is the fact that it gives the audience, I think, more ownership. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that, you know, and if you feel a certain ownership to it, you're going to be more involved. You're going right. to be more emotionally attached. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, all you have to do is mm-hmm. look at shows like, Archer, its highest rating is its fourth season. Sons of Anarchy going up and up. It, yeah. Not that long ago, it was unheard of. Yeah. Your fourth season, you started to go down. Right. And what's happening now is people are discovering The Wire now. You yeah. know what I mean? Starting from the beginning. Television yes. used to be disposable, <laughs> and now mm-hmm. it is right. You can it build. You can actually yeah. build an audience. Yeah. You can build you, a library. Yeah. So the whole business model is changing on the repeat, yeah. which mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. And then the, only, the final thing is also the branded the branded entertainment side of it, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, in a way, what's happening now is the advertisers are starting to uh, bypass the gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, really content is now, you know, it, it's it, some of the best, funniest, I think comedy space works really well, I think, but some of the best, funniest comedy is branded Absolutely. entertainment comedy. So yeah. again, there's so many opportunities now to kind of, you yeah. know, create something. Because um, ultimately, well, except for HBO, because they don't really care about advertisers. But um, <laughs> uh, for those that are looking for eyeballs for, for advertisers, I mean, you know, again, What's happening now is is you're able to connect directly with the advertisers and the ad agencies to mm-hmm. create compelling content. Yeah. We have another question over here. Hi there. There's been a lot of discussion about original material and the material being authentic. If you uh, were a producer and you had the rights to a book and or an original series idea, and you were fortunate enough to get in to pitch it to any of you. Um, do you prefer the material to come in with a writer attached or do you like to collaborate on the choice of a writer because you have writers that you generally work with? You know, it depends. I'll, do you want me to... I'll please, mm-hmm. please do. <clears throat> it depends. If it's a book that... It really depends on the book. If the book is just an undeniable wow series, we can find a writer. If the book requires interpretation and shaping and a real point of view of how to take the material and turn it into a series, then I you know, might prefer to have a writer, or I might see something in it and then work with the producer and find a writer. It, it can really go either way. There isn't really a preference. It's just you work with what you get, and if you recognize something in, either in the original idea or the source material, you, you, know, you just want to get there and control it. So you'll do whatever you need to do to have it. I, I think it's the same for us. I mean, it's really sort of a project by project basis, and and I think that you know, again, going back yeah. to what I originally said for our mandate, um, it really is about the event. You know, if the if the book or the original story or whatever it is that you're bringing in, if we see an event, a path to production without a, a, a writer, and we can sort of build it from the ground up, which we've done on a, on a few of our movies, then absolutely. Um, but you know, if 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 the writer brings a particular point of view. A uh, particular take to the material that will elevate it, then you know you might want to think about that as well. Writers are always in search of material, so mm-hmm. yeah, always, <laughs> always, <laughs> always. I think we got one more question in the middle there. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Or wait till up. next year's Gatekeepers Town.
Hi, thank you for the discussion. It's been really interesting. Um, my question goes in the same direction as of uh, the man over there. I'm, I'm a German screenwriter and director, and um, because you you just earlier said you're you're um, lo looking in the, the next years, you're looking for international content, and it's been yeah, globalization is is an interesting point. Um, I'd like to know how much local color. Um, are you actually looking at, in, or do, would you like to have in, in your content? How much can it, um, how much can you put in there? Because obviously you're looking mostly at an American market if you if you create mm -hmm. shows, and um, yeah, um, and would it be, for a, like for a writer like me, would it be a USP to put more German-related content into a, a show idea, or would it be, yeah? Yeah, I, I leave it open like that. Sorry. Well, John, you've got a great example with Welcome to Sweden. I do, um, <laughs> but it's you know it's also an exception. Mm -hmm. um, I, look, I think it, um, we started by talking about being authentic and how that the best projects come from, you know, a level of authenticity and and to me specificity. I think that's really important. The truth is that if you're pitching and want to get a show sold in the U.S., you're probably more likely to uh, for it to happen if it if it speaks to an American audience, which means probably, you know, you can have a U.S. setting. It doesn't mean it has to. And obviously, there's more and more international co-productions, big event series and, and mini series, limited series that take place all over the world or in, in worlds that don't even exist. Mm -hmm. So, to me, I, I don't think you start by going where sh where should I set it, or uh, it's really you have to start with a great story and a great idea, mm -hmm. and that's what's, what's going to get the interest of at least a company like mine. Um, and then we'll figure out, you know, does it make sense for an HBO, an FX, does it make sense for a Sky, mm -hmm. Channel 4, an RTL, and, you know, but the great thing is you can really construct now um, almost a consortium of, of broadcasters to get your show made, um, and you don't necessarily go in thinking, you know, I'm going to make something set here because I think they'll buy it. I w I'd, you'd rather tell your story that, that, is, that is meaningful to you, and then if it's great, it'll find a home. Nicole, do you have anything to I, add? I, I completely, completely yeah. agree. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really what the story requires. Mm -hmm. If it's a yeah. fabulous story and it needs to take place in Germany, mm -hmm. and it's, there's a compelling you know, reason, and mm -hmm. that I think it all, it's all about character. Yeah. It's all about character. And again, I mean, uh, we said it before, but you know, authenticity. Because if you're trying to shoehorn something into a story mm -hmm. that just doesn't feel right, I mean, it, it's going to stand out. You can feel it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You can feel the... You, can, we, you know, we haven't talked about it, but don't trace trends. Don't yeah. look at what's happening yeah. and say, oh, I need to do the next Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I need to do the, it's, you know, we put a pre, we just, we won't play in any sandboxes where anyone else has been. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just not, it's just not, it mm -hmm. makes my job really hard. Yeah. Really hard. <laughs> That's right, because the bullseye is about <laughs> that. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I and think, it's, it's true, yeah. because you don't want to, you know, you, you want to be you want to be the ground. You know, the, the yeah. trailblazer. Yeah. You want to yeah. break new ground. You know, you don't want to be sort of following in somebody else's footsteps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we and we're the same way. We don't want to feel like we're repeating ourselves. Yeah. We don't want to be know. second to the party. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So pretty clear message: story, character, original, original, original. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Wonderful panel. Generous with your time and information. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.